The side event is co-sponsored by the World Wiggle Congress, Christian Solidarity Worldwide, Students for a Free Tibet, Tibet Justice Center, the FIDH, UNPO, Civicus, and the International Service for Human Rights. My name is Rafael Viana David, and I'm very pleased to be moderating um, today's session. Uh, before starting our event, I would like to recall a couple of points. The first one is that we will not tolerate any instance of intimidation or retaliation against any of our speakers today, either in oral interventions or through unauthorized um, pictures or otherwise. Please note that my colleague Paula, so just here raising her hand from ISHR, our colleague from the World Wiggle Congress, as well as our colleague journalists at the very back are the only three persons taking pictures or recording today, and uh, um, so they, they are the only authorized um, pictures I will have from the event. If you'd not like to be photographed, please um, flag it to those persons. Um, so for today's event, I'm honored to count on the presence of um, a diverse pool of experienced um, and inspiring um, activists and colleagues working in or in support of communities across the Uyghur and Tibetan regions, Hong Kong um, and mainland China. Um, I warmly welcome on this occasion, um, well, starting from this side, Pema Doma from uh, the Tibet Advocacy Coalition, uh, my colleague Dolkan Iza from the World Uyghur Congress, um, Liung Tat, a former Democrat member of Hong Kong's Legislative Council, as well as Claire Denman, UN um, Officer at Christian Solidarity Worldwide. Thank you very much uh, for coming today. I will turn in a few moments to our panelists. Um, but before, uh, before this, I would just like to recall we're going to have a round of interventions followed by uh, some questions either here from the floor in person or from those joining us online. Um, and we'll conclude our event with some closing remarks. I apologize in advance for, for my voice. I've been the victim of changes of weather here in Geneva. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I hope that I can remain until the end of, uh, of this event. Um, now, so the, the release of the, UN's, um, the UN Human Rights Office's report on Xinjiang, as we've all been aware, has with reason uh, prompted significant concern from the international community on what could amount, of course, to crimes against humanity, as I think most of us uh, already know. Um, it, of course, shed light on widespread abuses that have targeted Uyghurs um, and other Turkic Muslims across the Uyghur region. Um, but UN documentation of widespread abuses across China is not new and long predates the report. Um, this includes, of course, a strong rebuttal against um, the Hong Kong and China's government, use of national security law um, in Hong Kong from the Human Rights Committee no later than July, last, uh, July this year, sorry. Um, and since 2018 only, uh, the UN special procedures experts have issued 83 letters to the Chinese government, as well as 28 press releases. Um, addressing a wide range of violations um, affecting Tibetans, um, human rights defenders across uh, the country, and other communities. Uh, more than two years ago, over 40 of those experts uh, jointly denounced the, I quote, repression of fundamental rights in China, from the repression of protests and democracy advocacy in Hong Kong, the collective repression of the population, especially religious and ethnic minorities in Xinjiang and Tibet, to the detention of lawyers and prosecution and disappearances of human rights defenders across the country. So today we're here to hear, we're here, sorry, to hear from, from you, from our dear colleagues uh, that have been working with these communities about the long-standing structural patterns of abuses that are commonly affecting the communities that you support, um, as well as the common root causes uh, that we can find across the country. Um, so I'd like first to turn to you, Pema. Thank you so much for joining. Um, the Tibet Advocacy Coalition has long exposed abuses faced by Tibetans. Um, could you share a little bit more with us and with your audience today about the main patterns that you have observed and seen documented by UN experts that have really hindered the capacity to promote cultural rights of Tibetans and the, the ability of those um, um, in, in doing that promotion in the, in the country? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Raphael. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the question. I will definitely elaborate on that. Before doing so, I would like to add that for me, as a young Tibetan woman, as a daughter of refugees, and as executive director of Students for a Free Tibet, I am very, very honored to be here today among so many distinguished panelists and experts from impacted community representatives. I would especially like to thank Rafael from ISHR for moderating the session. Today, the human rights situation in Tibet is worse than ever. Tibetan activists and writers are routinely arrested and sentenced to prolonged prison terms for cultural and other activities, often on the charges of inciting separatism 
subverting state power, or unlawfully obtaining or sharing state secrets. Under this framework, Tibetans no longer have the right to a lawyer, nor do they have a right to an open trial. They can be kept for indefinite periods of time in detention, and they may be kept at undisclosed locations for interrogation. Many of them are subject to long-term torture and ill treatment, others to enforced disappearance. In February of 2022, six UN experts raised concern over the arrest and physical well-being of Tibetan musician Gunduk Takpa, Tibetan writer Lopsang Gunduk, and Tibetan school teacher Rinchen Ki, all of whom were arrest arrested and disappeared in connection with their cultural activities and favor of the Tibetan language and culture. Similarly, in July of 2021, four UN experts expressed concern over the arrest and enforced disappearances of Rinchen Tsuldrum and Go Sherab Gesso, pointing to a worrying pattern of arbitrary and incommunicado detentions against the Tibetan religious minority, some of them amounting to enforced disappearances. This trend is not new. The 11th Pension Lama, Gedim Chiki Nima, one of our most important Tibetan Buddhist leaders, was disappeared by the Chinese government in 1995 at the mere age of only six years old. The Chinese government continues to ignore calls for his release. They continue to ignore UN expert concerns or the UN Child Rights Committee's requests for access to establish his whereabouts and his health. China's restrictions on Tibetan cultural <coughs> rights, including linguistic rights, also pose a severe threat to the transmission of culture to Tibet's younger generation, a threat similarly faced by Mongolians, Uyghurs, Hong Kongers, and others. As part of this effort to undermine Tibet's culture, <coughs> nearly one million Tibetan children aged six to 18 years old have been separated from their parents and forced to live in China's vast colonial boarding school system in Tibet right now. In these schools, they are unable to learn in Tibetan. They are not allowed to practice their own religion. And many children do not return home at all during an entire school year, and they are completely cut off from their family, their culture, and our natural way of life. The former High Commissioner stressed the importance of children learning in their own language and culture in the setting of their families and communities in her statement following her recent visit earlier this year, which failed to include Tibet. Such calls are not new. CERT 2018 concluding observations, CDAWs and CESR 2021 list of issues have all consistently raised China's language policies in Tibet. This crackdown has been made worse by restrictions on access for human rights monitors and a near total information blackout. For 17 years, no UN expert has been allowed to visit Tibet. The last UN expert to visit Tibet was the for former Special Rapporteur on Torture, Manfred Novak in 2005. There are currently over 15 outstanding requests by China, to China by UN experts, some of which have been outstanding for over 15 years. Meanwhile, no UN High Commissioner has visited Tibet in over 24 years, since 1998. Even during the former High Commissioner's recent visit to China in 2022, she did not visit Tibet. The situation has reached such severe levels that in June 2020, over 50 UN experts called on member states to take decisive measures and act with a sense of urgency to address China's human rights violations, including in Tibet. Not one expert or two, but 50 UN experts. We are now two years on from then, and the crisis has only worsened. China is not above <coughs> the international law and should not be treated as such. Due to the time constraints for today's event, I will leave it there for now, but I look forward to engaging in more Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Pema. Um, now I turn to you, Dolkin. Um, the OACJ report that we've already um, discussed um, does address extensive evidence of um, widespread abuses targeting Uyghurs and other ethnic Muslims um, across the Uyghur region. Uh, but of course, these abuses, as you know, you've documented, um, are not new. They've very often been tested in, in, in Tibet before. Um, could you share a little bit more with us about the main obstacles that you see also in the transmission um, of religion and culture across the Uyghur region? Thank you, Rafael. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank uh, International Service for Human Rights and the other uh, organization who hosts today's side event. 
uh, on August 2031, uh, Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights published the, this report on grave abuse taking place targeting Uyghur and other Turk, uh, Muslims. This report is significant, but language is very weak. Not enough to describe the real atrocity. We have been raising the concern of the human rights abuse, genocide, crime against the humanity, and the happening against Uyghur in the past five, six years. However, the report offers the most definitive assessment of the issue faced by the Uyghurs and other Turk people from the world leading human rights mm. body. <coughs> Mostly notable, it, is, it finds that arbitrary and discriminatory detention of the Uyghur and other Turk people within the context of the other restriction may continue international crime, in particularly crime against the humanity. This is the significant. As has become clear by now, current situation of the Uyghur people have, has never been more urgent. The Uyghur community is suffering incredible as the action of the Chinese government have put very existence Uyghur people under threat. In the last five, six years alone, Chinese government has subjected Uyghur people to mass arbitrary deten detention of the million of Uyghurs in the concentration camp. They are, the, they are subject to several abuse, such as torture and the gender-based violence, violation. We don't know exactly number, but we estimate at least three million people are still in the concentration camp today. Mass sterilization and the forced ab abortion Uyghur women and the other birth prevention measure in order to diminish Uyghur population. Forced labor and the modern slavery of the hundreds of thousand Uyghurs attempt to destroy unique Uyghur identity and the to pos possible assimilate the Uyghur people into the Han-centric China. Destruction and political, uh, physical re repression of Uyghur identity, including thousands of mosques, gravier, uh, and the other side of the religious, cultural, and historical importance to the Uyghur people. Ban on use the Uyghur language in the school and the public uh, space. Separating Uyghur children from the parents who are detained in the camp to indoctrinate them to be loyalty to Chinese Communist Party and forsake the Uyghur identity. We estimate at least one million Uyghur children separate from family. Harassment and the punishment of the Uyghur diaspora and anyone who dare speak to out. I'm one of the uh, example and victim of this. Taken together, Chinese Communist Party is trying to destroy and erase Uyghur people. The transmission of the cult or, or cultural, religious tradition is being criminalized by the state. This has deep consequence on the future generation Uyghurs and other Turk people who will live no longer able to identify with their roots. This also creates disconnected between diaspora community and the, the, those still living in the homeland. This can be also been seeing the government targeting Uyghur intellectuals, including professor, doctor, journalist, editor, writer, arts, among others. Since 2017, Chinese government has implemented different policy in attempt to rewrite historic textbooks and has sentenced many editors and the publishing host staff involved in the printing and the distributing earlier version of this document, which were previously approved by the government to be used in the classroom. Yalkuruzi, Hurban Mahmud, uh, president of the Xinjiang University, Tash Flati, president of the uh, Xinjiang Medical University, Halmrat Hopor, Sakharov, Price Laureate, Ilham Tokti, that's all is one of them. However, that changed in the 2017 when the government began considering them as extremist ideology or separatism. At the same time, Chinese government has targeted Uyghurs and the Turk religious figures as a, such an imam, possible disappearing them, detaining them, and imprisoning them. As a response to this crisis, nine parliament plus European parliament in the world recognized Uyghur genocide and the crime against the humanity. Following passage resolution is United States, UK, Canada, Netherlands, Lithuan, Lithuania, Belgium, Czech Republic, French, and Ireland, as well as officially recognized by the US government. In December 2021, Independent Uyghur Tribunal confirmed this allegation in its final judgment, highlighting the legal obligation that signatory of the UN 
genocide con conventions must prevent Uyghur genocide from happening. Many survivors have shared their testimony in great details. In May 2018, I have lost my mother in one of the concentration camps. My father died in the mysterious circumstances. My younger brother was sentenced to life in prison. My older brother, two over the 17 years in prison. As a result, my human rights advocacy. But it does not stop here. The situation for all people living under Chinese Communist Party rules has destroyed dramatically in recent years, while repression has always existed under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. The situation has become much more under the rule of the Xi Jinping. Any perceived difference from the Han Chinese majority is perceived as a threat to the national interest by the Chinese government and subsequently attacked. Everything that makes all people or community unique is being subject to signalization and assimilation. Uyghurs, Tibet, Hong Kong, Southern Mongolia have been targeted in particularly due to the, their ethnicity. Chinese government has tried to erode, uh, erode and undermine their unique language, history, culture, religion, and ethnic identity. Children are being indoctrinated to forget about their unique uh, ethnic and religious identities. Identity. The basic right and the freedom of this group are being denied or stripped from them. Any meaningful voice of society is being ruthlessly stamped on. The problem has become existential as the CCP commit numerous atrocity to achieve the goal to a social reengineering and assimilation. Hong Kong are witnessing the right and, and the autonomy being stripped out from, uh, from them. Tibetans are saying their culture, identity, and environment are destroyed. It is no responsibility, member state, and the observer of Human Rights Council to respond to the United Nations High Commission uh, 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 Human Rights finding and the tangible action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dolkin. And uh, we can already see, you know, drawing some some parallels between you know, your intervention and that of, of, of PEMAS on, on the use of national security, um, be it you know, to target um, uh, communities as terrorists or as separatists. Um, and in connection with this, I would now like to turn to you, um, Wing Tat. Thank you so much for, for being here, for joining us. Um, as um, I think Hong Kong provides an example of a different jurisdiction um, under which uh, the government has been instrumentalizing, uh, instrumentalizing sorry, national security. Um, through a restrictive legislative framework and that it has uh, hampered civil society's ability to mm -hmm. promote and, and protect human rights. Um, as we were saying, just for a little bit of, of context also for our audience, um, in, in July, the Human Rights Committee um, has uh, reviewed mm -hmm. Hong Kong and Macau's compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, mm -hmm. um, uh, providing very strong findings. Um, could, you, could you elaborate, could you yeah. tell us a little bit more about how you see the current reality um, under you know uh, Hong Kong and, and civil society in Hong Kong under the national security law after this review? Yes, thank you. Would you need to uh, uh, talk about this subject? Um, I served the Hong Kong Legislative Council from 1991 to 2012, five terms. I retired, but I still very involved in these kinds of uh, human rights protection campaign. This is my following statement. After the enactment of the National Security Law on July 2020, there was a drastic deterioration of human rights protection in Hong Kong. The forced closure of the independent press like Apple Daily and Stan News, and also the forced closure of a large amount of human rights NGO and independent trade unions, make Hong Kong become a city of no opposition voices. Even after the release of the report by the UN Human Rights Committee on May July this year, there was no sign of any improvement in human rights in Hong Kong. I will focus on the development of the following three areas. First, low improvement of the acts of the government after the release of the UN Human Rights Committee reports. As a priority recommendation, the committee asked Hong Kong to take concrete steps to repeal the national security laws and pending the repeal to refrain from applying it. It also called on Hong Kong to protect 
the right to a fair trial without discrimination based on political opinion. However, the reality is very different. The new Secretary of Security, Mr. Tan Bingkeng, Tan Bingkeng, reiterates in a press interview on 16th of September this year, we confirm that the government's intention to enact another national security law under the Article 23 of the Basic Law in order to widen the government power. In response to the query whether the speech therapist union case will stifle the freedom of expression, Mr. Ten did not clarify the difference between comments or criticisms by ordinary citizens on government policy and incitement to hate governments, which is a criminal offence under NSL, National Security Law. Many citizens were convicted only because they criticized the government policies. Mr. Ten also reconfirmed the government intention to enact laws to control fake news and social media. Another minister, the Secretary of Justice, Paul Ten, said in an interview on July this year, he said that he noticed the concern of the public about the long delay of trial of the 47 democracy activists and political leaders, case 2021. 47 peoples, many of them were elected legislators. Majority were locked in the prison over one and a half year, without bail and without trial. After Mr. Paul Lam interview and the release of the UN Human Rights Report, there's no improvement in the situation. The Human Rights Committee demands the lack of clarity on national security and on the types of behavior and conduct that constitute criminal offense, which undermine the principle of legal certainty. He also expressed concern and restriction to fair trial rights in particular, Article 42 recreates the presumption against bail. As 74% of persons charged with lecture security crimes have been denied bail, this uncertainty creates a significant deterrent effect on civil society organization and activists in the ability to cooperate with the United Nations. This is de detailed in the ISHA report recently released on the impact of the national security law in cooperation with UN. I am able to speed up because I have left Hong Kong. Otherwise, I will face retaliation once I back Hong Kong. The second part, freedom of expression. The Human Rights Committee expressed concern about, quote, the adverse effect of overly broad interpretation and arbitrary application of the national security law and sedition legislation and its impact on exercise of freedom of expression, including the in intimidation and the arrest and arbitrary detention of journalists, politicians, academics, students and human rights defendants. We have expressed dissenting opinions. I'll give you some example. The need of Social Democrats, a small political party in Hong Kong, on mid-September this year, organized a small event that the member distribute pamphlets, only distribute pamphlets, to citizens and encourage them to express the will in the coming chief executive police address that they are warned by the police and the hygiene department that the act was against the election security laws and hygiene ordinance. They have, no, they, have to con they have no choice but to cancel the events. B, a former professor of the Polytech University and deputy director of Hong Kong Public Opinion Research Institute, Professor Zhong Ginhua, were questioned by the NASL police two times on February this year. Why? Police asked ask him, why is the institute organized survey, only survey, organized survey about Ukraine war. Professor Zhong left Hong Kong under pressure. Third example, in the past, university school of Hong Kong 
play an active role in commenting government policies. Now it is a complete silence. Criticizing government policies can be treated as a kind of opposition act, and the university top management will softly advise the academics to stop. Many dependent academics have left Hong Kong and more will leave. Third area, unchecked police power. Also, the need of social democrats, as in the past, they want to organize a small peaceful march to government headquarters to express the demand of universal suffrage on 1st of July this year. A few days before the event, hundreds of police from the NSL office branch went to different homes of different core members of this political party and warned them they would be arrested if they went to march on 1st of July. The chair lady of LSD, this party, have no choice but call of the event. On 1st of July, all core members of this political party were followed by the police whole day. This was reported in Hong Kong News. No one member in the new Legislative Council asked questions or any press editorial questions the police asked. In summary, the Human Rights Committee explicitly called on China or Hong Kong to repeal the national security law. The International Committee as a whole should echo this all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Wing Tad. I think indeed, as, as, as you mentioned, the, the Human Rights Committee's report provides very strong findings. And I would like to highlight one point that you raised that we think is very important, which is the, the an element that is core to the UN and to the Council's ability to respond to um, a crisis in a given country, which is uh, the ability for a civil society on the ground to cooperate with the UN. And uh, there's a, the, the report provides a compelling argument that um, there is a strong deterrent effect in the ability of, of uh, activists and NGOs to do that job and hence to inform the Council and expose um, abuses. This is also something, of course, that we see um, across mainland China. And perhaps just to quote from the the annual reprisals report uh, presented by the Secretary General that has just been issued a couple of days ago um, that says, quote, that civil society actors from within Hong Kong and abroad have continued to express fear of cooperation with the UN, discontinue cooperation, or decline to engage with OACHR and UN human rights mechanisms since they perceive this cooperation could be construed as a contravention with the national security law and in particular with its provision under collusion with a foreign country. There's also, of course, also mentions um, about uh, reprisals against human rights defenders across China. And now I turn to you, Claire, so that you can provide us also a little bit with more clarity on this as um, among all these letters sent by special procedures over the past years, um, letters and opinions and, and, and re press releases have addressed uh, attacks against, def against 92 human rights defenders. Um, thank you, Raphael, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a privilege to speak alongside such a distinguished panel um, and all of you gathered here today, and for those of you who are watching online as well. Um, at CSW, we focus on the right to freedom of religion or belief for all faiths and those of none. Um, and in China, we've seen a deterioration in the right to freedom of religion or belief amidst the broader crackdown on human rights violations in the country the criminalization basically of, of basic freedoms um, and the sinicization of religion or belief. And so it's through that lens that I will approach Raphael's question looking at um, the situation for human rights defenders, and particularly those defending the right to freedom of religion or belief, but um, also slightly broader too. And I'll focus on two trends that we have seen across mainland China, and they neatly tie into some of the um, elements that have been discussed by some of my colleagues on the panel already. The first one being the systematic curtailment of civil and political rights um, in the name of national security. And the second, the use of arbitrary detention and enforced disappearance as a tactic of coercion and control. Both bypass basic due process and contravene China's obligations under international human rights law. So on national security, the Chinese government's abuse of national security in law and in practice to justify repression against the Uyghurs, Tibetans, human rights defenders, lawyers and journalists has been, and in Hong Kong and on the mainland has been well documented. 
who have seen human rights experts repeatedly raise concerns about national security being used to restrict these freedoms. Back in 2015, the High Commissioner for Human Rights expressed concern about the implications of the national security law that was adopted in July 2015, saying that the law's extraordinarily broad scope and vague terminology left the door wide open to further restrictions of the rights and freedoms of Chinese citizens and to even tighter control of civil society by the government. All critical and dissenting opinions are characterised as threats to national security, justifying far-reaching restrictions. Now, I recommend an article, an infographic, that's been produced by ISHR, which analyses 23 key communications and press releases by special procedure mandate holders and the opinions of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention since 2018, as well as the Committee Against Torture's 2016 recommendations to China. And it really hammers home the point that the Chinese authorities' national security motivated restrictions fail to meet the standards of legality, necessity, and proportionality. In our own analysis at CSW, the inclusion of national security in the 2018 regulations on religious affairs and religion in Article 27 of the national security law combined to give weight to policies and measures which compel for and other human rights. The revised regulations on religious affairs further tighten control on religious activities. And they state that religious groups, schools, and religious activity sites and religious affairs must not be used to endanger national security, but under very broad terms. We've documented a number of cases of religious leaders who've been detained under national security crimes, such as inciting to subvert state power. Freedom of religion or belief cases are particularly sensitive in China, and therefore lawyers and human rights defenders who take on such cases have been frequently barred, fined, harassed, evicted, even imprisoned and tortured. Human rights defenders who persistently and peacefully challenge violations on human rights face similar harassments and intimidations by the authorities. Those who continually take on fraud cases become targets and can be jailed or disappeared. This includes Gao Zhizheng, who's very well known for his courageous defense of freedom of religion or belief minorities, and he's been forcibly disappeared a number of times, most recently in 2017. And Zhang Weiping, who was held in communicado detention for almost a year and remained in pretrial detention, accused of subversion. Both men had been previously tortured in detention. But even for less high-profile cases, there have been numerous obstacles to justice. Lawyers report courtrooms with police armed with guns, <coughs> the forging of evidence by the authorities, lawyers block from meeting with clients, and the use of torture to elicit oral confessions during criminal investigation. Sometimes the authorities pressure the lawyers' firms or their families to drop the cases. And just to quote a human rights lawyer that CSW interviewed recently, when human rights lawyers find it difficult to defend even their own rights, how can they defend the rights of their clients? If they are targeted for seriously upholding the dignity of the existing law, what should they do? Chinese authorities make widespread use of residential surveillance at a designated location. This has been well documented by UN experts in the form of enforced disappearances. And in 2018, 10 UN experts wrote to the Chinese authorities with exactly that question just to kind of ask about the terms of that kind of style of detention um, and uh, with recommendations for um, its repeal. It's currently a practice that's under Article 74 to 79 of the Chinese Criminal Procedural Law, but under this measure, an individual can be held in police-designated location for up to six months. Individuals held in this way report having no contact with family or access to legal representation. Under these conditions, torture is likely to be investigated and much more likely to occur in the first place. It's a law that's often applied to activists, journalists, religious leaders, lawyers, and anyone perceived as challenging the party's absolute hold on power. Essentially, RSDL takes the accused off the map. The very people who are needed to support the accused are they themselves detained. Now, I'm conscious of time, but um, just to say that we're also concerned about the risk of torture and also of ill health in detention. Um, which I think has been also addressed by some of my colleagues on the panel already. And just to uh, end, I guess, to say that I just urge you um, to pay attention to the numerous 
examples, the evidence that's been collated and collected over many, many years, both by the UN um, bodies, by civil society representatives, both in Geneva um, and those working more discreetly, and to, um, yeah, just the international community must make a consistent effort to work with, listen to, and support Chinese human rights defenders to take heed of these calls, and particularly, in my opinion, of establishing an independent um, UN mechanism to investigate violations in China. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I know we're running a little bit out of time. Um, it's complicated with, within, within an hour to, to, to talk about a, an issue that is so complex and, and so cross-cutting. I would just perhaps like to also um, highlight one point that you raised, which is, um, and I think this is really, again, cuts across um, our four panelists, which is a widespread use of, of arbitrary detention, you know, as a sort of like a, a second step <laughs> after, after um, the targeting of defenders of, of entire communities. Um, and this widespread use has been also um, has been uh, documented, of course, uh, first by the UN's own working group on arbitrary detention. And the, the degree of documentation and of severity of the use of arbitrary detention has prompted the working group to, um, to, to uh, reiterate on a number of occasions in opinions um, about individual cases that, quote, there is a systemic problem with arbitrary detention in China, which amounts to a serious violation of international law. Um, with this, I wanted to conclude this first part and open now the floor for questions, if there are. Um, given the time limits, uh, of course, we'll only be considering questions and not statements, and if you can limit um, interventions to two minutes um, and identify yourselves um, when you are um, raising your hand. Um, so. Commissioner has visited in over 24 years. Can you elaborate slightly on some of the consequences of that um, on Tibetans on the ground? Thank you. Um, sorry, just, just before giving you the floor, Pam, I'm just seeing if there's any other questions. I don't think we'll have um, time for more than one round. Is there any other question? I don't see any. Pema, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Lorian. Thank you, Raphael. And perhaps also some of our colleagues in the panel may also have something to add in addition to that. As um, lack of monitoring is, is a difficulty for many peoples. Um, I think thinking about that question, just, just from several days ago, I think of the example of what's happening inside Tibet within this past week. Um, some of you may have seen the news, um, including coverage from the New York Times and civil society organizations about the crackdowns that are taking place in the capital of Tibet in Plaza right now under the guise of COVID protocols. And um, many of us working in advocacy and in the civil society space have been in secure contact with folks inside Tibet um, who have shared videos of living conditions under uh, these crackdowns and repression as well as first-hand testimonies of what that consists of. And actually on my way to Geneva, I, I heard the news that you know one of the individuals who we even were spoken, uh, speaking with informed us that the police are now going door to door after the publishing of the New York Times article, demanding people to hand over their phones and to go over people's like phone contents to see who has the videos that were leaked to the outside of Tibet uh, about the COVID conditions. And um, it was just only less than 24 hours ago where the person who we were in communication with shared with us that it's okay for us to share that news, um, despite initially wanting to hold and wait before sharing that information about the the door-to-door -door and, uh, and the detention. So at this time, it's not verifiable where those individuals who were detained under those door-to-door -door searches were taken, what the outcome was, or whether they're being charged with anything or just detained uh, for the time being. But it's common practice inside Tibet for people to be detained for over a year without any uh, formal charges. And I think about some Tibetans like Tinchok Jimpa who reported on illegal mining in Tibet. His last words were, if these are my last words, I still have no regrets for reporting to outside sources about what's happening inside Tibet. 
And in fact, several years later, he was killed in, in Chinese custody. And so those were his last words. And for myself, I think to myself, if I knew that the issue I was speaking out about was the last thing I would ever say to the world, what would I be willing to speak on? And inside Tibet and inside other regions, we see that there are time and time again individuals, human rights defenders, who are brave enough to potentially speak their last words by speaking out on these critical issues. And I think the lack of monitoring, the lack of an independent monitor from the UN uh, really does mean that Tibetans inside Tibet on a daily basis have to make a decision. Am I willing to let these words be the ones that I die on? And that's kind of the decision that many Tibetans have to take in order to speak out on issues such as climate change, environmental degradation, um, even repressive policies such as uh, the quarantines that have been mandated for all Tibetans, including those that are not sick with COVID which are taking place in Hassa right now. So I just felt that that example of what just happened over the past several days is the exact reason why independent monitoring becomes so crucial in spaces like Tibet. Thank you. Thank you, Pema. I think you articulated this, an idea that we all share very well. Um, is there any other question from the floor? Yes. Hi, uh, Dave, excuse me, Dave Elsberg from the Human Rights House Foundation. Um, just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists for your uh, compelling stories um, and, and information. Um, uh, more of a political question, I think, than anything else. Um, many of you have I, I, we've been here for several days. Um, it's, of course, been many days since the High Commissioner's report came out. I'm curious if you could speak to the reception that you're getting from delegations and your uh, thoughts on the likelihood of, of action uh, by the council this session. Thank you, Dave, for asking the question that it's on everyone's mind. Um, is there any other question? Oh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Rafa, and to all the panelists, so Field Lynch from, from ISHR. Um, really a follow-up to, to Dave's question, and that is that any assessment of China's human rights record based on objective criteria and principles of non-selectivity and discrimination, non-discrimination um, clearly warrants meaningful action at the Human Rights Council in the form of the mandate of an international investigation. Um, we all know, though, that China has um, phenomenal power to mobilise, um, to incentivise and to intimidate, including uh, delegations. And so my question really is this, in, in the face of the possibility of failure on a left resolution, um, what's your, what would your advice be to delegations that are contemplating action? Are they um, better off only trying um, if success is guaranteed? Or does the situation and the interests of victims and survivors um, demand that they take action regardless of prospects? Thank you very much, Phil, um, for those two questions. <laughs> I think everyone is here seeing who's going to speak first. Um, so I'll, I'll get back. Uh, I'll give the floor to, to each and, and every one uh, of us here. I think uh, there's a lot of, um, of, of, of possible angles of response. And I'll just add perhaps one question that connects those both, which is you know, now in front of you and you know, online and in person, you have an audience and you have the ones in, uh, that hold the power to perhaps um, lead to action. Um, so what would you be, what would be your message to, to, to the international community too? Um, I'll go first with you, Pema, and then we're going to go in order. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, given the question about the report, Dogen, would you like to go first? Uh, I'm also happy to. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah this uh, report has come out. No, is there is no excuse anymore for the member state and the uh, high commissioners and United Nations. Should be it is the time should be take act. Just empty promise or report published report is uh, a change nothing because still people is suffering. Still is million of people in the uh, suffering concentration camp. So first, this is a, uh, a fifty one section of Human Rights Council. On the agenda, we haven't seen any serious. Uh, agenda also will issue about this, this only side event, 
but is the uh, High Commissioner Office on the Council's uh, agenda not behind it? This is a very disappointing issue. So that's why this is the time High and uh, uh, Council should be urgently and uh, debate on the Uyghur uh, issue on this, uh, this report. This is the first thing. Secondly, should be, uh, and uh, uh, now is the same time uh, in the New York and the General Assembly is taking place, and the, uh, in the Hormat Council is taking place. So should be resolution of the Uyghur issue by the member state. It is necessarily at the moment. And, the, and the, it is also necessarily to appoint it and the special procedures and special reporter and thematic issue on the Uyghur issue. And also United Nations, uh, because a lot of Uyghur refugees is suffering in the different of country. They have faced and deported to China. So uh, United Nations High Commission of Refugees, or United Nations should be set up and the mechanism protects the Uyghur, Uyghur refugees around the world. And also, uh, all company, in, because today is the China's second big economy, uh, because coming to this level on the all European countries and the all developed countries, the Western countries have much responsibility because China, and because of this financial help, because of technical, technical help, coming to this level, now being second uh, big power, use this economic power to crack those Uyghur, Tibet, Hong Kong, now is the Taiwan sovereignty is under uh, dangerous. So that's why this international brand, international uh, and, uh, company should be kept uh, tight with China. It is not correct time business as uh, usual. This is my presentation. Thank you, Dolkin. Um, Tema, go ahead. Thank you, Dolkin. Yes, I, as, I, as I thought, you handled the report question um, quite well, <laughs> better than I did. <laughs> so the situation inside Tibet truly never has been worse in my perspective. With over 80% of Tibetan children as young as four years old being raised in Chinese state-run colonial boarding schools, the very culture, religion, language, and identity of my people, the Tibetan people, which has existed for millennia, is now facing an unprecedented level of um, our existential fight for survival. And we are calling on governments to respond by working collectively to provide a robust response to the human rights crises being faced by not only Tibetans, but also Uyghurs, Hong Kongers, and many others, in order to prevent the continuation of these widespread abuses. I urge member states to initiate and support efforts to establish an independent mechanism to monitor and report on the human rights situation on the ground. I would also like to add that given the severe restrictions on access to Tibet, it is also imperative for member states to urgently press China to permit special procedures access to Tibet, which it has not been given for decades now at this point, so that they can conduct meaningful, independent, and thorough investigation of the human rights situations on the ground. And to answer the question, I feel that given the level of unprecedented existential risks that are being faced to the Tibetan way of life, the Tibetan identity, that even if success is not guaranteed, action is vital. Thank you. Thank you, Pema. Okay. Uh, a brief response to the question is that uh, we don't know what kinds of results will come when the best solution discussed in the Human Rights um, uh, Commission or here. But one thing I think every country that respect human rights and the people in that country basically can do is that urge your governments always put these questions about Tibet, Uyghur, Hong Kong human rights problems on the radar. Ask a parliamentarian of the country, make a debate on the parliament, make this thing always be visualized in the media so that no matter whether there's a best solution in UN, still country around the world, civic society around the world, human rights will go around the world, we still can do something that make this thing always on the political agenda around the world. Then China cannot accept to answer these questions. Thank you. Thank you, and Claire? Uh, yeah, great, this one. Um, thank you. So to try and wrap up some of the questions all at once, um, we've waited a long time for this report to come out by the High Commissioner. Um, we don't want to wait a long time for action on it. Um, and I know that the Chinese civil society out there will just echo those concerns, um, having had to wait so long for the report to be um, published. And so the evidence is out there. It's been out there for a long, long, long time. Um, the High Commissioner's report was a great step by the UN, but it shouldn't 
be the only step. Um, this, so I would say that we've got to keep calling for an independent international um, investigative mechanism, something like a commission of inquiry. Um, I know that a number of special procedures have asked for access to the region, including in June this year. Um, so we echo those calls as well, but I think it's important to note that even if access isn't granted, and this comes back to uh, Gloria's question as well, there are, there are established mandates where there hasn't been there hasn't been access to the country. That shouldn't prevent um, states from, from wanting to take action. That shouldn't be one of the barriers. So I'd say, despite the pushback, we've got to keep um, coming back to the ground. It can't be an excuse for impunity. Um, and I think trying to work towards it, regardless of whether it's successful, um, just makes the point that, that, yeah, it sends a signal that we're not going to allow impunity <coughs> to continue um, on egregious human rights violations. So, yeah. Oh, and the mic won't work for the end of the event, so I'll just take this one. Sorry. Um, no, but just perhaps to provide a couple of concluding remarks. Um, the first one is that I would say that um, the OACJ report um, does provide an important opportunity, and I think the message also that goes across this panel is that this opportunity is, a, is, is the one of looking not only at what's happening in the Uyghur region, but at looking at really the structural causes that enable those um, egregious violations all across the country, and this requires us to broaden our attention towards um, the, uh, the Tibetan communities, towards Hong Kongers, towards human rights defenders and lawyers across mainland China. It is also, of course, I think, a joint message of, of solidarity with defenders, which is a, and, and of, with activists and victims, which is a goal in and of itself of action at uh, the, the Human Rights Council level. Um, and perhaps I would like to, to end with a, highlighting one, one key finding of the OACHR report, which is, quote, that the conditions remain in place for serious violations to continue and recur. This means that we're not just looking, this is not just looking at the past for accountability, this is an important goal. We're also looking at preventing further violations. So the message I think here is, is, is pretty clear. Um, you will find outside of the room also a copy of uh, an analysis by CHR of China's situation in light of objective criteria for HRC action um, that a couple of, uh, that the majority of uh, council members have endorsed. Um, so you, you can read more through there, but I, I would say that um, in light of this prevention angle too, I think we all concur to one point, um, which is to say to, to Human Rights Council and to member states that the, act, the, the time of course to act is now, you've heard this, but this means that in, in, in a couple of months it will be too late, and next year will be too late, and March next session will be too late, um, and there's a responsibility of the council not only to be looking at the past, but also to be looking at the future to stop um, violations from happening. Having said this, I would like to thank really everyone for having joined here in person, such a, a crowded room and also online. And of course, we, remain, we will remain available for, for any other information. Thank you very much and have a good end of afternoon. <laughs>